Welcome, Mr. Smith. We're so pleased that you're joining us today. My name is Key Evans. I'm the chair of the Democrats Abroad Global Veterans and Military Families Caucus. I'm from New Mexico, and I live in Guatemala. The VMF Caucus has members the world over, and we are from every state in the United States. The caucus works tirelessly to represent and advocate for all military members, veterans, and family members, regardless of where in the world they live. One of our caucus priorities for 2023 is repatriating deported veterans. And we definitely look forward to hearing from you on this issue. Good, on good. with us today is LaDonnell Jazz Moore, the chair of the Democrats Abroad Global Black Caucus. Jazz, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the Global Black Caucus. Yes, thank you, Key, and thank you, uh, VMF, for having the Global Black Caucus present in such a great opportunity and such a great podcast as well. The purpose of the Global Black Caucus is to provide a forum for all of our Democrats Abroad members to better understand the issues and concerns affecting Black Americans especially to help eliminate unconscious bias within the Democrats Abroad membership and in America, to help engage with Black voters living abroad and ensure that their needs are met within the DA community. And we're needed also to advocate for reforms for, uh, to political issues. We encourage and facilitate Black Americans abroad to engage, become informed, and exercise their voting franchise. And before we actually kicking off and, and started, there's a huge thank you for your service that I would like to address to our uh, guest of honor, Mr. James Smith. I have a, a military family background as well, so I kind of feel all the struggles that you, well, not all of them, but a lot of the struggles you might have gone, gone through in your life. And Key, when you're ready to introduce Mr. Smith, there you go. Thank you, Jazz. Mr. Smith. We appreciate you joining us to discuss this important issue of deported Black Americans. So now, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself and about the Black Deported Veterans of America? Uh, I first started this journey in 2013 uh, as a broadcast journalism student at San Diego City College. Uh, my assignment was to look for expats that were living in the Tijuana era of area of Mexico. While doing my research online, I came across a message board for uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Applegate or for Colonel Applegate. And it had this term deported veteran on it. And uh, it, for some reason that, and um you know, I, I guess you could say by by uh, a providential ways, things lined up for me to get more information from it. As a student uh, there, there's a group here called Veterans for Peace. Um, it's the Hugh Thompson chapter, chapter 91. And at that time, they would do this um, these events they called Arlington West on Memorial Day, on Veterans Day and such. Uh, so I met uh, Jan Ruman at that time. So uh, I happened to go by Jan uh, because Veterans Day was coming up. I went by Jan and I'm like, yo, have you ever heard of this thing called deported veterans? And Jan tells me, he's like, yes. As a matter of fact, would you like to speak to one? And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, the, this is the first guy that we've gotten back. And that was Fernando Cervantes. So I, uh, I had a, um, I interviewed Fernando. And uh, did a package on him for Stories de la Frontera. And um, I actually received a, a student Emmy a nomination for that. Uh, but they used that to go around, you know, uh, as they went to lobby in Congress uh, to bring the idea of what deported veterans were, was about. Um, from that point on, uh, I was invited to come to different events. And I went and documented them. Sometimes some people coming back like Daniel Torres uh, or, or to seminars at like U.S., you know, University of San Diego or different schools around here. 
Uh, and then in 20, uh, 2021, no, in 2018, uh, 2017, 2018, I can't remember off the top of my head, Hector Barajas was coming back. And uh, I went down and I, I spent the, the day before the night uh, and, uh, uh, and, and crossed with him. Uh, as to add to this idea now that I was starting a documentary. So I was documentary, you know, documenting these different events that was going on. And um, every place that I had been or every person that I had talked to, they all said that, you know, there was veterans that had been deported to, you know, to Africa, to, to Jamaica, to uh, all other por ports, of, I mean, points of the world. But what you only saw and what the the media saw that what media that was there or anybody saw was the latin portion even though even though i heard it and i documented it it, it didn't never locked into me that there were a, a a lot of black deported veterans because also at the same time i didn't know how many actual deported veterans that there were but i just thought it was wrong regardless of whether it was 10 or ten thousand. Uh, so in 2021, I was contacted by uh, Veterans for Peace, Dan Ruman and, and Maurice Martin, uh, to see if I wanted to go to uh, D.C. Uh, to document this thing called the Leave No One Behind mural uh, project. They were uh, doing a, a installation in D.C. In, in April of 2021. Mr. Smith, uh, may I may yeah. I um, interrupt you there? Because what what is in my mind right now is that maybe a lot of the audience members um, are not even fully aware of the term deported veterans. Could you enlighten our audience a little bit more what that term actually really means um, so that they all have a bit more of a better understanding? Okay. In 1996, uh, there was a, an act passed called the uh, Illegal Immigration Responsibility and Illegal Immigration Reform Act. And what it did was it paralleled the crime bill of 1994. It paralleled the, the crime bill now in immigration court, meaning there was mandatory sentencing for things that, that generally before had been uh, considered misdemeanors and where uh, uh, judges had the ability to pass their own judgment on. Judges, in, when that act passed, judges no longer could consider military service. So like in criminal courts, you could still do that. But in immigration courts, judges didn't have that that latitude to say, well, let me look at what your service was. So there are cats out here that have that, that were deported that are multiple, multiple like bronze star, you know, winners, you know, that are, are highly decorated. But what their character of service was was never or was never in question during that, that portion. So in that, that's what created the deported veterans. Now, I'm not saying uh, veterans had never, ever been deported before 1996, but before that law came into play, uh, judges had the discretion to, I mean, the ability to use discretion on uh, uh, military servicemen. And after that, they no longer did. So that that's what created the, 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 the one of the ingredients that created this this canvas for it. The other was the Department of Defense lack of wanting to have a unilateral way of citizenship and, and dealing with people that were coming in. The, a lot of times there's things that we know, but we can't prove that the evidence isn't there, but the accumulation of the story kind of lets you know it's true. Most of these cats were all uh, all told that they would get their, their citizenship uh, if they joined the, the service. And theoretically, that is an accurate statement that you it, you could expedite your way, depending at, at what time in history that what was going on, it could be expedited in the situation. But, you know, to be honest, recruiters will do anything to get you. My, my recruiter got me high before uh, I wound up signing the paper. So uh, recruiters will do anything uh, because they got numbers to meet. You know, almost all felt that they had their, their citizenship. Uh, many of them, when I asked, well, you know, uh, why didn't you follow the process? Because I wound up hearing that there's a process that you got to go through. And, and some of them said their command told them there was no need for them to do that. 
Uh, I try to give the benefit of the doubt that because most of us are ignorant of how the process goes, that maybe people in their 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 kind of command really thought that well, yo, when you took your oath, you know, uh, in boot camp and uh, and such, you you became a citizen. So don't worry about that, you know. So these they know these stories exist. You know what I mean? Uh, enough enough to say we must give some latitude for that. Now, had there been a moratorium on this, you know, and this is why I tell people it wasn't a mistake. We didn't just get uh, uh, sucked up in this because this this happened as part of a, um, uh, a basically a military bill. Everybody knows it as the Immigration Act, but it was actually a Division Three of the uh, uh, Omni. Um, uh, omnibus, it, it, but it was basically the the budget for the military and for the police and and all these different uh, organizations uh, that they were setting up. This was pushed in to Division Three. There there wasn't a a lack of understanding that veterans weren't going to get caught up in this situation. So this is on purpose. And that's what most people need to understand. You know, I was just asked by Reuters the other day. It was like, you know, what do you think people don't understand? And I'm like, this was not a mistake. They will try to say this, that, well, you just got caught up. But when you go and shut off that they cannot consider your military service, that means you had to have considered that the veteran was going to wind up in this net. And you could have done a moratorium. Even Ronald Reagan did a moratorium for young kids when uh, uh, the Immigration Act, the Immigration Act that they had passed during that time period. You could have come back at any time. The moment you, even if it was a mistake, so let's say it was a mistake at the beginning. As soon as you found out about deported veterans, you could have said, "Okay, from this point on, we're going to give every veteran a year." If you don't know what your status is as uh, uh, and your citizenship to, to come and, and file your status and go on from there. But that's not what you did. You, you've never shown a compassion to the situation as it gone on. I mean, to be honest, this whole situation with the uh, uh, envy, you know, well, you probably haven't gotten there yet. So I, I'll save that for the, the question that you go ahead and ask me for that. But. Um, but yeah, that's what a deported veteran is. To be honest, it's someone that's been betrayed by their, their government, not by the people. What, what, what really sticks out there is that you said that this isn't a mistake. This has, that there's a purpose behind this. And the U.S. has deported tens of thousands of military veterans since the passage of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996. Um, some estimates point to at least 94,000 majority of the service members deported were legal residents who committed at least three misdemeanors, making them deportable. Um, we also know that America's misdemeanor problem is completely based on the systemic racism. Um, so about how many how, how, and how many percent of the deported military veterans would you say are Black, Indigenous, people of color? And would you also say that there's somewhat um, systemic racism behind this whole dilemma? Well, one, yes. You would have to say, well, with what we characterize systemic racism as, I would agree that yes, it is because the people that are mostly affected by this are people of color and, uh, and low income. Uh, and these are where the military targets are for people. I've shared before, if people have ever left this country and been somewhere else, you have to understand that the picture that America presents outside of here, and even in our Facebook, you know, we don't really pay attention to it, is that of a military might. There's no sports, uh, major sports event that happens that you don't see the military. There, you don't see the president without seeing the military. Almost every place that you that you do or see that represents America, there's a military might. There's military people at the embassy. There's military people. You know what I'm saying? So the uh, militarism is a part of what being America is to the world. So if you sell the idea that militarism is the strength of America, why wouldn't you think that, that someone coming here that wants to fit into being American not find a value in that? So if, you, if that person finds that value in that, you know you're using that to your advantage. I'm going to just toss these numbers out to you. And this is, this is just something that I wound up looking at and just came in front of me. I mean, not just came in front of me, but wound up coming in front of me. On my Facebook, after I started posting about this stuff, 
I started getting a lot of different ads about compensation and benefits. You, you know, you do this, get to 100% compensation and benefits. And I'm like, well, damn, you know, uh, I wanted to find out this is an industry, right? So I'm like, okay, well, what does, how do, how could they have benefited by this monetarily? Let's just use last year. Okay. If you were 100%, 100% service connected, you basically got about $40,000 for that year, right? All right. Now, you just said 94, let's just say 1,000. Oh, no, let's just say 100. Let's say we're just dealing with 100 people, all right? So 100 deported veterans deported off that 40,000. That's 40 million. So that's $40 million that, that I didn't pay out to these guys. But because they're not recorded as going out as veterans, when I ask for the budget, I get to budget my budget against their actually being here. So that body is catching this money, uh, you know, when they're when they're they're inflating their budget. Or, I mean, not inflating their budget, but when they're conjuring their budget, they're saying this: these are the eligible veterans that we have uh, have for this eligible for medical services, service connection, and such. But if they don't claim it, that's not on us. But we we must put that in our budget so that we can pay it, right? So now, so. What happened to that money while all these guys were fucking deported? And you figure guy cats have been deported for 10, 20 years. So let's say 20 years from now, what that would be. Because 30 years from now, that would be uh, 1.2 million that you gave given to one person who never had to pick up a rifle, who never had to uh, show up information, any, any of those things. Just stay out of trouble. You basically stay out of trouble and you'll maintain your compensation and benefits. That's not really a great business model, but if I can find a way to keep you from getting to it, then that money gets to stay in house. And since nobody's looking for it, or at least at that time period when this all got started, nobody's looking for that. Everybody's focused on what happened to the deported veteran and how messed up that portion is, but nobody's looking for how did this benefit them to do that? Why is it that 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 throughout the history of the bills that have been uh, submitted uh, to overcome this situation, not one has been submitted by a Republican? Every one, every single one of them has been submitted by a Democrat. Though we hear, honestly, we hear that there are Republicans on that side. You know, Republicans uh, that uh, uh, do want to be in support, but they don't want to be the first ones to cross that bridge. Mr. Smith, I have a a question, and I want to make sure I get this right. You testified before the U.S. House Committee on the Judiciary Subcommittee on Mm -hmm. Immigration and Citizenship. Uh What kind of pushback did you get from the representatives who did not support your testimony? Okay, well, uh, first, that was submitted for testimony uh, mm-hmm. there, uh, but I wasn't physically there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, I I have another question, if you don't have anything right this moment, Jazz. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, Jazz heard the estimated number of 94,000 deported vets. I heard 74,000 deported vets. So I'm pretty sure nobody has any records on how many there really are. Um, they can find it. They can find it. Yeah, they if, find if it. they wanted to. In countries where vets are deported, Mexico, Haiti, for example, I know that there are cartels that are specifically looking for recruits with military training. How vulnerable are our deported vets to recruitment by gangs and cartels? You gotta make a living and you gotta survive. So you have those decisions that you gotta make depending on the environment that you're in. You know, one of the things that made, uh, that, that was so special that not everyone I think understands about the Deported Veterans Support House and and eventually unified U.S. Deported Veterans was that by them having a place to come together, they were able to escape, you know, escape some of those those life changing decisions. Those that uh, were not in those communities, uh, unfortunately, had to make some decisions. And 
I don't spiritually judge that person, but I, I do understand with from dealing with some of the cats we have that we in our group that are in Haiti, and um, one of our, our our close uh fighters and and compatriots, Nick Paz from Repatriate Our Patriots. Uh, he travels all through Central America, and Mexico, and into some of the most dangerous areas. You know, just just to let that, a, a deported veteran know in that area that we're we're on the case and we're trying to do what we can for him. So I know these things exist. I know that um, uh, that they're, they're very very real. Um, uh, they've also been portrayed in Ready for War. I don't know if you saw that, but the film Ready for War it's on Showtime. That was a documentary that they did. It's portrayed there. But um, I've talked to their cats that I know personally that had to deal with that situation uh, and stuff. They're, what makes them vulnerable is they have a discipline that they've learned. Uh, a more disciplined, you know, soldier or, or soldado or, you know, uh, where, I don't know, whatever, wherever you're at, Kenya, uh, where, whatever place that may be. Uh, going through those type of things, a, a, a United States military serviceman is a, is a highly trained and valuable asset. And uh, if, if that person uh, would buy into your I ideology, you know, it would damn sure strengthen your, your military capability. So uh, they're a high desire. And, you know, the thing is, you're dealing with people that they don't play by the, the markets of Kingsbury rules, you know. So uh, sometimes they can get roped into a situation that they have no choice. It's just a survival. Mm -hmm. And in other ones, it's, well, this is the skill I have left coming back from combat. My, the, you know, I, I know cats that, that want to go back to combat. They, they only feel comfortable mm -hmm. in combat, you know. So th this is one way that some of them may exercise that situation. So... It's very real, uh, and, and that's one of the ways that they're susceptible to. Yeah, I know that military trained individuals are, are very valuable. And so many of the deported vets maybe haven't been in the country they've been deported to since they were very small children. They have no friends. They have no families. They may not speak the language. Mm -hmm. And I think that would make them even more vulnerable because here is a group, even if it's a violent cartel, who is willing to accept them. And I Can you hold that... for just a second? A buddy of mine here is one of the deported veterans. I had to deal with that. This is Mauricio. Hey, you guys. Yeah, Mauricio Thanks. came back uh, last year, right? Uh, yeah. And Mauricio... Valentine's Day last year. Right, and Mauricio was down in um, in, in TJ during the time. He's all, he's the subject of a couple of documentaries. Uh, Bring them home. Um, you in ready for war? Yes. Yeah, he's in that, that ready for war uh, and stuff. His story is there, and it, it goes to what you were just asking me about. So um, I just so that you would get a personal answer to that question about the, having to deal with. Being a, a, a military person, especially a combat veteran, and being approached by the cartels and having to deal with that. This is somebody that can actually answer that for you. So my name is Mauricio Hernandez Mata. I'm formerly deported a combat veteran, currently disabled. I'm 100% rated for PTSD, 50% for hearing loss, 10% for tinnitus. That's my rating to the VA. And there's other things I'm also working on. But um, as far as that goes, I was deported to Mexico uh, for over a decade. And in that decade, I had to move, I had to leave town roughly four times because of job offers that I didn't want to take. Now, I had that option to take them. I had the option to not take them and stay. But there are consequences that come with that. Now, the main concern should be how they find out who you are, what you used to do for a living, that you're a deported vet or that you're a deported combat vet, in my case, with training and experience. So with that being said, there's a couple of ways that I was approached. I was approached uh, verbally every time with an offer. Two of those times they came with backpacks full of money and they were like, what do you want? You want the money 
or you want to walk away and see if you can walk away. So it's just a matter of perspective. It's a matter of luck. I was very lucky. The places where it happened to me, where I was at, who was around. And it also helped that I'm hyper vigilant. And I always had like plan A through Z while I was down there to just in case, because I knew the situation I was in and I knew of other people that got put into that situation. So with that being said, it's a reality. It happened to me. I know it, deported veterans are, for lack of better words, an issue that is often thought of as a simple word, deported veterans. There's never a face behind that, right? I don't know if I, if you understand where I'm going with this. There's a difference hearing it, and there's a difference seeing one and saying, hey, what happened to you? So in that decade, that happened to me. I, I don't want to get into specifics long story, but it happens, right? And I made the choice to not get involved. Hence, I'm here. There have been others that made the choice to get involved because it is always a choice. You can choose to live as a slave or you can choose to risk it and, and probably lose your life in, in your own ways. And that's a whole other ball game because there are cases where you can say whatever you want, if you're there alone, but if you have a family and they're like, well, guess what? You know, you got a family, bro. You know what you want to do about that. So, yeah, I, I, I think, I think uh, Key and I uh, are in unison and, and, and expressing our, um, how sorry we, we, we feel um, to, to learn what you actually have gone through, not just in the service and, and, and PTSD drama and, and, and physical drama that, that is attached to it, but also afterwards where you're actually physically and emotionally having to deal with now just because being a deported veteran, which is somewhat so wrong on, on so many levels. Um, how, do, how do you as individuals maybe come together, work together, uh, bind each other together to overcome obstacles in the places that you're living? So a, a lot of it is um, that there are certain people like James or other organizations to name that address the deported veteran issues. Now, most of us deported veterans fall under any one of those flags while we are deported because it just it's, it's just a matter of luck who approached us or who we were who were approached by or who we approached, right? And who we started working with immediately that in, that in turn uh, got the ball rolling to where guys are coming home. And usually it's under those flags like the Black Deported Veterans of America or the Deported Veterans Support House or um, Unified Deported Veterans. It's usually under one of those that guys come home. It's not like uh, there's deported veteran support houses popping up everywhere there isn't. You know, there's very few groups that actually care enough to keep that group open somehow because uh, they're mostly nonprofit organizations. I know because I started with a man named Hector Barajas, and, you know, he used to do this, that, and I had to go and talk to the, all kinds of press and, and do all kinds of different things just to bring awareness to the issue so that people would see that things are happening. And so Hector could keep going, not only helping me, but all the other veterans he was helping at the same time, because there are thousands of veterans deported across the world, not just in Mexico where there are cartels. I mean, there's veterans in Africa that are worried about warring tribes. You know what I mean? There's vets everywhere. That It just depends where you're at situational, you know, what you're worry is and 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 what really the circumstances are in my case i was in mexico cartel violence all that i'm glad we came my family got humanitarian program real fast because uh behind my house there was only one street and behind that street it was a big lonely dirt road where the government would come every 90 days like clockwork and dig out bodies and take truckloads full of bodies. It was a cartel cemetery. And that's where I owned my house where I was raising my daughter. I lived there. I had six, I had three pit bulls and four American bullies in my yard. I had razor wire around my house because it was mine. So I could do that. 
you know, and then besides that, whatever, you know, we had a safety room. My house won't be made out of wood, but I had a room made out of cement for when the shootouts were at. I would take my family, whatever time it was, take them into the safe room. You know what I mean? And everything was under window range. And there's all kinds of stuff that people go through, right? I can tell you what I went through and why my family's here and why we're happy to be here. And, and we're not happy to be here because we got away from that. We're happy to be here because, God damn it, I'm an American. I fought for this country. I put foot to ass for this country so that the people that deported me could have that fucking right to deport me because I committed an error and didn't get my citizenship somehow down the line when I already thought I had it because of circumstance. And that's a whole other story. But, you know, God bless America. I've told it a thousand times. I'm not, I know hard feelings because America has never been perfect. They eventually right their wrongs. And I'm not saying that all deported veterans came home at once, but, you know, on a case by case basis, they're starting to pay more attention to us now than they were 10 years ago when this all started. You know? Yes, you are an American. And thank so, you. And yes. I am so, so happy that you and your family are back on American soil. And thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I could see in your face that it was a little bit painful to talk to us about it. But, you know, I live in Guatemala. I know there are gang and cartel problems. And there are probably some deported vets here. I don't know. Yes, I'm um, sure there are. I'm assuming that there are. And... Thank you for giving me a little more insight into what the individual goes through with, you know, you want us to wipe out your family or take this bag of money and come join us. And I, I so appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you. And, and if I may add, I said I'm an American and I just want to make this statement. I understand that when most people hear I'm an American, they think American citizen. No, American is something, is one thing, and American citizen is a completely different thing. And I will be an American citizen on February 8th. I'm having my oath to be sworn in. Oh, wonderful. Like that is wonderful. Guys that bit of good news and let you guys know that I am one of the fortunate ones. Yes. Because there are many people like myself, I don't know how many there are, in very different circumstances than I am. So that is what this whole support thing is about. And I just had a guy tell me today that I spoke to, hey, don't forget about us. We're still down here. They're telling me that. So, and, yeah. and I just want you guys to know that there are a lot of guys that are not as fortunate as I, but from me to you guys and from all those guys that need that support, thank you all truly for, yeah. in general, just every little bit helps. Yeah. Every little small. Well, we, we have a worldwide audience Absolutely. and this will be heard. We, we will we will share your stories and your messages. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. It's for, yeah. for everybody out there. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Mr. <laughs> Smith. Um, yes. As a global political organization dedicated mm -hmm. to, to vets, what can we do to help you? One, the, one of the greatest things, I think, is, is, is we need to, to continue to bring awareness. We, we have several uh, media campaigns that we're, we're getting ready to roll out, like starting tomorrow. We have the uh, uh, America Speaks, you know, what do you think about deported veterans? Because I had gone on um, several trips through, basically through the middle of America, and I uh, interviewed people in different states. So I'm using uh, snippets from those interviews of what they felt about deported veterans uh, so that, you know, people begin to, you know, hopefully as a, a thing, people begin to notice more that it's, the, the problem is, is going on in Congress. That, that's where the, prom, the problem is. Uh, there is a partisan si situation because the Republicans want to continue. The Republicans that are not, that are fighting against it, want to keep conflating immigration uh, into this issue. 
and to those of us that are actually fighting this issue. Uh, this is a veteran issue. This is an honor issue. The immigration is a tool that you use. But when you made it so the judge could not consider the service, uh, our service, and then you did not give a space of time, a moratorium for us to get that, you know, for us to get that right. You you allowed them to tear apart the one, and 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 you're the Department of Defense. You're our leaders, but you you allowed them to tear apart the one. When we get it, when we're brought into the 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 service, on my very first night when I got off that bus and I stepped onto the tarmac. One of the first things that they teach you is there's no black Marines, there's no white Marines, there's no brown Marines, there's just green Marines. And for me, a black kid coming from Detroit and, uh, the, you know, lived through the 70s and his early 80s, I'm like, I don't have to, the, you know, I got to a point that I didn't have to worry about who I was through my color. I just had to work on the merit processes of what was there. So I had something to buy into and I bought into this whole situation. There was never a thing in my mind, where were you born at, uh, would decide what the value of, of what you, who or what you were in this service. We became, you, you made us march to become one. You made us fight to become one. You made us chant to become one. You made us all one. You said that we were above the civilian, regular civilian population because we were giving of ourselves and our lives for the sanctity of them. And then you turn around and say, but you weren't born here though. So that don't count for you. That's that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so um, yeah, so basically it's to, to, to help move the needle in Congress. Uh, um, uh, one is to reach out uh, to the Black Caucus. Like currently, we have, we reached out to the NAAC. We have supporting us uh, right now is the uh, California State, uh, NAA, California and Hawaii State Caucus of the NAACP for the Armed Forces uh, uh, Affairs. And um, we partnered also up with our local uh, Poor People's Campaign here in San Diego. Uh, Yusef Miller is uh, our uh, outreach coordinator and recently uh, joined uh, joined with us, and he's on the executive board for the uh, Black Panthers, uh, uh, local Black Panther Party, and um, uh, the North County uh, NAACP. Uh, one of our other partners, Olivier Lazaro, uh, is the commander of the BFW 7420. And another partner of ours is uh, Will Smith, the commander post 310 uh, here in San Diego. And uh, we have a mission to, uh, in connection with our partners, repatriate our patriots in El Paso, Texas, but here in California, uh, we have a mission to go through every one of uh, the uh, these chapters, posts uh, and branches and make sure that not one in uh, California doesn't know the deported veteran uh, issue. And here, if California, we believe that if California rings about it, then everybody's going to wind up getting it and ringing about it. Uh, we have uh, some fighters that are, have uh, uh, recently are coming in to uh, support this movement. And, you know, we're blessed to be able to, you know, uh, contribute to it. You know, there's uh, a lot of organizations. There's people at the ACLU like Jenny uh, Pasquela, uh, Amanda Schiff at Im uh, Immigration Defenders. Margaret Stock, if y'all don't know those names, uh, there are people fighting this on so many levels. Those ladies are geniuses. They, they, you know what? That part of the part of the story behind this, I'm telling you, as a documentarian, I'm like, man, I if I wasn't doing this, there are so many beautiful stories that are in here because it's a, a lot of ladies that are making the things happen. You see us guys out front. But like in my crew, it's it's ladies that are making the you know moving the, the the pieces and the phone calls and everything. These ladies came up with a genius thing and reached out to law schools, you know, uh, to to come into this thing. So they wound up getting Yale Law School. They got Duke University. They got University of Texas. They got Brown uh, to to uh, their students to take on the cases of these guys, you know, all around the world. That, as long as we could get them to them, then uh, uh, they took on their cases. So they they need, you know, defense help. 
Uh, most of them are going to need uh, what's called post-conviction relief. You know, now um, uh, we need to find criminal lawyers in the states where these guys are at to be willing to take those cases, uh, especially, you know, uh, uh, take those cases and utilize them as especially part of their pro bono. Because basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, ABA says, hey, you know, can you at least do 50 hours of pro bono? So we're, we're actually getting ready to send a letter. That's another thing we got coming up. I get out this week is a letter to all the ones that I found in um, all the ones that uh, the lawyers that I found in uh, online that I found in Google that said that they uh, did post conviction relief to them to see if they would donate their time, donate their uh, pro bono time for that. So they need that. We're also needing to uh, find a way to bridge the gap for them to have mental health services, you know, uh, in, in during the process of that. The VA is is challenged because uh, under their charter or the way their situation is set up, if this person has a problem, they can't call anybody for emergency services in another country. So they they so they're kind of staying away from that. So we're looking for uh, institutions that are willing to be the mental health uh, uh, advocates for for them. Uh, so that uh, we're looking for, especially, I don't know, maybe these are things that you guys can help them with out there. Or if you want to set up a funding for, they need passports. You know, they need, you know, a lot of the times what happens is they need, well, not a lot of times, all of them have to get a passport and then they have to go get, um, uh, they have to get a passport. Uh, they have to get a report from the police. Sometimes that's free. Sometimes it's not. Uh, but a report from the police saying that they haven't had any problems and stuff. And uh, some of these guys just don't have that kind of money. It, it, for us, it may, may, may not seem like a lot, but sometimes it's hard getting it in. We've been trying to get this uh, one of our guys uh, down there in Haiti, his passport. And, and we know he's not messing up the money or, or nothing down there. You know, I mean, this guy's been he's hit. If he gets the money, he's back. And he's got a time frame to get it. Then he's back, and they have housing and things set up for him. So those are the kind of things that that you know to toss out there that they need. I don't know what it is that you guys can provide other than you know um, uh, without going into a, a cost area, uh, other than you know awareness. You know, follow pages. Uh, you know, we're going to design a newsletter and. Uh, we'll try to design a newsletter, but, you know, follow, the, basically follow like the, the Facebook pages and the Instagram, all announcements will be there uh, and, and stuff. I mean, you're going to be in my contact list now. So uh, I will, you know, um, things that are going on like February the 21st, we have our um, uh, February 21st, we have in our press conference, which is basically our introduction, uh, our public introduction to the world. We've been around that. We'll, been around for a little over a year but uh now with the support group that we have we want to make sure that people understand that the deported vet uh, veteran issue is there but it is not just our brothers down, you know south of the border that, but there are black deported veterans as a matter of fact there's asian deported veterans there are middle eastern deported veterans there are veterans from all over we've been in contact with one of the guys in our group is from bosnia we got two cats that we help from Canada. They're everywhere. You're mm -hmm. every, you Google deported veteran and click on images. You won't see many of us. I know. I have done that. And I've watched some of your videos on YouTube. And I follow your Facebook page. Okay. And you have all of our email addresses. Keep us posted. Most and definitely. know that you have our support appreciate that appreciate that and that you know they will too so i mean if you can think of think of what it is you 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 know i love to discuss more what you know because i'm sure you got to go back or talk to some people and stuff but you know hit me up what you guys feel like you can you can offer that I mean our thing is we're looking for partnerships with people that say hey listen this is what we have to offer as opposed to saying, hey, you know, can you give me this? Can you give me that? Can you do this? Because everybody has has whatever it is, their skill or influence or, or, or leverage, you know, that they can, uh, you know, add to the uh, add to the piece. Uh, so 
there's no, I, I don't think there's no um, way going towards a, a productive end that, that, that we wouldn't all um, entertain. Are you talking to anybody else, like repatriate our patriots or? Um, we'll be talking uh, with uh, Mr. Baraha soon. So, yeah, we're we are in contact with others. Yeah. Definitely. OK. And, well, yeah. definitely. What we definitely could do, uh, Mr. Smith, is um, through sharing your stories and your knowledge on this topic, we can inspire all of our American eligible Americans Americans living abroad that are all eligible to vote to become even more engaged in making sure that we do elect and re-elect Democrats up and down the ballot. Um, that is what we are mainly focusing on as well. And that is also probably the an easier way to get your voices heard in Congress as well. So um, for everybody out there who's tuning in and listening in, and if you're not a member yet of Democrats Abroad, you could do that, of course. Visit democratsabroad.org. And don't forget to register your ballots. You have to do this every year. Not every state will do this automatically for you. So go to votefromabroad.org and register to receive your ballot because there are special elections this year in all a lot of states. Not all of them, but a lot of states. Um, Every year is an election year. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Challenge every one of the candidates to what they're going to do about the deported veteran. Ask them, they <laughs> ask them every single candidate, what are you going to do about the deported veteran? Yeah. Absolutely. And also, um, Mr. Smith, I can also encourage everybody to visit your website, Black Deported Veterans from America, uh, sorry, Black Deported Veterans of America dot org. Um, and, uh, no, dot com. The, the website is Black Deported Veterans of America dot com. Also, mm -hmm. BDVA dot US. We just added that domain so th that to make it easier on people not to have to type it all the way out. Okay. Yeah, I've been looking for your website and I haven't been able to find it, but I sure found your Facebook page. Also, on behalf of the Global Black Caucus, thank you very, very much. I am a bit shaken by the stories that I've heard here and, and emotionally touched. And um, we, we really need to spread your messages, your stories. And um, yeah, so again, from the heart, thank you very, very much. Yeah. Of course. God bless. <laughs> <laughs>